So in this short video, we're going to look at intermolecular forces between simple covalent molecules, what the three forces are, and how the melting and boiling points of simple covalent molecules changes, and being able to explain why. So first of all, what are intermolecular forces? Well, if you look at these simple molecules here, we'll take water. The intermolecular forces are forces between the molecules. As a definition, they are relatively weak attractive forces between molecules that hold the simple covalent molecules together. Be really careful. Do not get those confused with covalent bonds. When we want to melt water, if it's ice, we have to break those intermolecular forces. If we want to turn water into a gas, we need to again break those intermolecular forces to allow the water molecules to escape from each other. We are not breaking the covalent bonds, which would separate the molecule into its separate atoms. Now, intermolecular forces are linked to melting and boiling point of simple covalent molecules because, of course, the stronger those intermolecular forces between the molecules, the more energy is needed to separate the molecules from each other, so the higher the melting and boiling point of the substance. The one other thing to be careful is we are not talking about giant covalent structures. The classic one is silicon oxide. In order to melt silicon oxide, you will have to break the covalent bonds between each of the atoms because it is a giant structure, not simple molecules. So there are three types of intermolecular force. The weakest one is a temporary induced dipole to dipole force, which we also call van der Waals, and that's the weakest. The next one is a permanent dipole to dipole, and the strongest is hydrogen bonds. So let's look at each one individually. So let's start with temporary dipole to dipole, van der Waals, which is the weakest. So if we take helium, one of the simplest atoms, uh, it has two electrons, which are orbiting the nucleus. Now, of course, they might both be on this side at once, which would make this side temporarily negative and this side temporarily positive. Or they might be here and here, which would cancel each out, so it wouldn't have dipoles at all. Or they might be both on this side, which would make that hang having a negative dipole and this a positive pole, making these dipole dimines too, so it's got two poles. And that would be over this side, or it might have something like this, where the electrons are both over here at any one time, which would make this side of the atom negative and this side positive. Now these are temporary uh, poles, um, and they're called dipoles because there are two of them, because it depends on where the electrons are, and that continually changes. So what effect does that have? Well, these can now induce temporary dipoles on neighbouring um, helium atoms. So if we had uneven distribution of electrons, like those here, that might be negative and it might be positive on that side. So a temporary dipole occurs, which of course makes that side negative and that side positive. And what that would do is it would induce a dipole in the neighbouring helium by repelling the electrons, because it's positive, to this side, making this side negative and that side positive. And therefore, those would attract each other. And that is your weak induced temporary dipole force. So why is it temporary? Well, let's have a look at this. Supposing we've got a molecule that does have the electrons orbiting and they just so happen to be over this side, that would make that a temporary dipole. And what it would do is it would then induce, it would attract electrons here and therefore this would be positive and negative and the same here. And that would have a rippling effect on all the molecules around. So that's induced a temporary dipole. If this dipole swapped the other way, because a second later the electrons are on the other side, then of course it would have a rippling effect and it would induce temporary dipoles on there. Then it might switch back and then it might switch back again. So you can see these are temporary 
But whatever it switches to, these are going to attract each other. So temporary induced dipoles dipole are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. Their temporary uneven electron distribution in one molecule induces a dipole in the neighboring molecules. It causes a weak electrostatic attraction between them. And of course, they'll have low melting and boiling points as little energy is needed to break the intermolecular bonds. Now, what increases the strength of these temporary induced dipole to dipole forces? Well, if we have a look at fluorine and chlorine. So fluorine is F2, and you can see that they will have these intermolecular forces here. And then you notice chlorine is a much larger atom, so the molecule of chlorine will be larger, and therefore its surface area is greater. So it will experience larger temporary dipole to dipole forces, so we'll have a slightly higher melting point than fluorine. So sulfur is S8. It consists of eight atoms in a ring. So you can see that sulfur has a very large surface area compared with chlorine or fluorine. So the temporary dipole to dipole forces will be stronger and therefore sulfur will have the highest melting and boiling point of these three. So one increase the strength, one is it increases with the surface area of the molecule and secondly, it also increases with larger atoms with a greater electron density. So, of course, chlorine has more electrons than fluorine, so we'll have a higher electron density. So what about the second uh, intermolecular force, the permanent dipole to dipole? Well, remember, this is due with electronegativity. So non-poly molecules are ones where the electronegativity is identical or very close together. So if you take hydrogen 2, that has identical electronegativities, so it's non-polar. But if we take polar molecules like hydrogen chloride, that's got a large difference in electronegativity. Remember, the shared pair of electrons are drawn towards the chlorine, which makes this end negative and this end positive. That is a permanent dipole molecule, di meaning two. It's got two poles, positive and negative. And of course, the other one is water, is another classic. There's hydrogen, there's oxygen, an even bigger difference in electronegativity. So of course, water produces its own polar molecule because the electrons, the shared pair of electrons, are drawn uh, towards the oxygen. And it's because they are permanently charged that they will experience an electrostatic attraction between each other. So if I show you these polar molecules here, this negative part will be attracted to the positive, this positive part will be attracted to the negative, and so on. And those intermolecular forces are stronger than the temporary dipole to dipole. These are permanent dipole to dipole intermolecular forces because these are permanent polar molecules. So first of all, you can see clearly that they act on all polar molecules. They're stronger than temporary dipole to dipole. And permanent dipoles arise from a difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that are bonded together. And finally, the greater the difference in electronegativity between two atoms, the greater the strength of the permanent dipole, because this end will be more positive and this end will be more negative with a greater attraction to the pair of electrons. Remember, polar molecules not only experience the permanent dipole to dipole, they'll also experience the temporary induced dipole to dipole as all molecules experience that. So what about hydrogen bonds? Well, you'll notice we've already talked about water, which is a polar molecule which experiences the permanent dipole to dipolar forces. But it also experiences hydrogen bonds the strongest intermolecular force. You'll notice that hydrogen and these three elements here have the biggest electronegativity between them. So it's these three only that experience the hydrogen bond with hydrogen because it's a large difference in electronegativity. So you can see there's hydrogen bonds there between the water molecules. So it only occurs between polar molecules which have 
an HN, an HO or a HF bond in them. Now it's much stronger than the other dipole forces but is much weaker still than the covalent bond, about the tenth the strength of the covalent bond. And so if you have a molecule that has these bonds in, it will first of all experience the hydrogen bonds, which are the strongest intermolecular force. It will also be a polar molecule, so it will experience the permanent dipole to dipolar forces, but it will also experience the temporary dipole to dipole intermolecular forces, because all molecules do that as well. So these molecules will have the highest melting and boiling points because they'll need the most energy to break those intermolecular forces between the molecules to separate the molecules. Now one thing you need to be able to do is to actually explain how a hydrogen bond is formed. And I think this is the most tricky part to do in the syllabus and it's normally worth four marks. And I suggest you draw a diagram to help you. So what we can do is we're going to use a water molecule to help us explain this, but you need to be able to draw it as uh, hydrogen fluoride, or you need to be able to draw it as hydrogen nitride, or you need to draw it as a water molecule which has hydrogen oxygen bonding to it. So I'm going to stick to the water molecule. Um, you need to practice this quite a few times, so I suggest you watch this video, this bit of the video, pause it, draw it a few times so you can get it. So I'm going to take the water molecule to start with. And I'm going to make sure that my um, my hydrogen atoms are on this side here. So my hydrogen atoms here, and that is a covalent bond with oxygen. I'm also going to put the nucleus of oxygen there, which is of course positive, and that is my oxygen molecule. And of course, oxygen has six electrons. It's shared two, so it's got two lone pairs, and that's a really key word. So I'm going to label this as a lone pair. Now what I'm now going to do is to draw the water molecule for this one orientated this way. I'm going to draw my hydrogen there and my oxygen there. And I can put another hydrogen. It doesn't matter if I put it on another hydrogen there. But the key thing is the hydrogen is here. And you'll notice I'm drawing that as the positive nucleus of hydrogen. And then those are your shared pair of electrons. And that is again hydrogen there. And this is oxygen, which has a positive nucleus as well. But this bit is the key. I'm going to label this hydrogen molecule. So I meant hydrogen atom. So I'm going to label this a hydrogen atom here. You'll notice that hydrogen only has one electron and that electron is shared with the oxygen so because it's the simplest uh, element you'll notice that you've got no electron shielding on this side from the nucleus of hydrogen which is positive which means it is quite strongly attracted to the lone pair of negative electrons on the oxygen molecule on this side and that is your hydrogen bond so in words, you would draw that and explain in words the following. And that is your explanation for how hydrogen bonds are formed. So how can we apply this to questions? I'm going to do two short exam questions with you and take you through what I would say. I'll explain it to you and then put it in words. So the first question is, in period three, so this is period three, you have P4, S6 and Cl2. Rank them from the highest to lowest boiling points and explain why in terms of intermolecular forces. Now, they will not expect you to know that phosphorus exists as a molecule which has four atoms. Sulfur, we've talked about, has a series of eight atoms in a ring and chlorine too. But they've done that, so you can clearly see. First of all, my first question or my first thought is, 
what intermolecular force do they experience? Well, they're not polar molecules, so they'll only experience the weak temporary dipole to dipole force. And so what will be the difference in them? Well, of course, they've got different surface areas. And the larger surface area of the molecule, the stronger the intermolecular force. So therefore, sulfur will have the strongest temporary dipole to dipole. Chlorine will have the weakest uh, temporary dipole to dipole intermolecular forces, so the lowest melting and boiling point because it will need the least energy. So this is what I would write. I'd first say all molecules are non-polar molecules. So we only have to consider the temporary dipole to dipole intermolecular force. Next, I've said the sulfur molecule has the largest surface area, so we'll experience the strongest intermolecular force. We've got to link that to boiling points. So this means its boiling point will be highest as more energy is needed to break the intermolecular forces. And rather than talking about phosphorus, I'm going to do the highest and then the lowest. So chlorine molecule has the smallest surface area and the weakest intermolecular forces, so the lowest boiling point. So the next exam question might be a six mark question. And it says, rank these molecules into the ones with the highest to lowest boiling points and explain using ideas of intermolecular forces why you have positioned them as they are. So remember, before you put pen to paper with a six mark question, think in your head what sort of things you're saying. Well, we know it's due with intermolecular forces, so there are three types. Have we got polar molecules there? And have we got any that experience the hydrogen bond? We can see that these two are non-polar molecules, so we'll only experience the temporary dipole to dipole. HCl has got quite a large uh, difference in electronegativity, so that will be a polar molecule and will experience a permanent di dipole to dipole and temporary dipole to dipole and will be stronger um, bonds. And finally, we do have a hydrogen bond because it's with hydrogen with one of these three, you've got hydrogen fluoride. So this will experience the hydrogen bond, which is the strongest intermolecular force, and so will have the highest boiling point. But we've still got these two to split up. Remember, they both experience just the temporary dipole to dipole, but that strength depends on surface area. That molecule of methane will have a larger surface area than just those two oxygen atoms put together. So this is how I'd answer it. I'd first say both O2 and CH4 are non-polar molecules, so only experience temporary dipole to dipole intermolecular force, which are the weakest intermolecular force. Now I'm explaining the link with boiling points, so the least energy is needed to break these forces, and therefore they have the lowest boiling points. I'm now going to say which is higher out of the two. CH4 has a larger surface area, so have stronger temporary dipole type forces, so has a slightly higher boiling point than O2. My next one will be HCl. The HCl molecule is a polar molecule because of a large difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and chlorine. HCl experiences not only the temporary dipole to dipole, but also the permanent dipole to dipole forces, which are stronger, hence a higher boiling point. Finally, HF experience hydrogen bonds as well as the other two intermolecular forces. This is the strongest intermolecular force, so the most energy is needed to separate the molecules from each other, hence HF has the highest boiling point. And that is a very clear six mark question. So you need to make sure you understand what the intermolecular forces are, the different types, how they're formed, and be able to identify which molecules experience all of them, two of them if they're polar, and only one of them if they're nonpolar.